So starting with you, I mean, I don't think anyone can lead anything if we're not feeling in, in tremendous shape ourselves. And I do feel that taking a look at our emotional fitness, uh, how we are in ourselves in terms of our, our self-awareness, our, our empathy, uh, how we foster a safe pace, a safe place of connection as we play, you know, our, our curiosity as we pursue growth over defensiveness, of course, our resilience, uh, how we understand our own and the mindfulness of others. And so then I, I think, and then critically important at this time is, is communication and how we communicate uh, with greater clarity uh, uh, and pace, et cetera. And my tips uh, at the end of this presentation, probably tomorrow, I'll send a series of re resources through uh, uh, to all of you. And my tips on enhancing your emotional fitness, I've got a couple that I've written about. The first is, I'm, I'm something of a warrior myself and I have my three buckets of worry, those things that I probably can do something about, those that, you know, it's going to take a bit more and the third bucket that probably I cannot change. But I do schedule a dedicated uh, a worry hour, a ring fence space in the morning, um, which is my most buoyant time to focus on what's really on my mind and what I do about it. The second is, I've done this actually since a little girl, but I, I build a self-esteem file. I sort of collect um, the positive, the kind, the meaningful inputs that I receive, and then I gratuitously revisit those uh, when my confidence is low or I'm experiencing some pushback or setbacks. It's sort of like my little pot uh, of uh, resilience, honey. And then how we help each other um, improving our communication. I've been criticized for this in the past, but I use, you know, emojis and rimojis and bitmojis to convey emotional information very, very quickly online. I use it with, you know, my teams, my, my family, my, my friends. I particularly love some of the fun ones. You know, this is a prickly subject with a picture of a cactus. Um, the lovely little monkey with the hands over his face saying, I don't really feel like, like talking yet. And I particularly love the sisterhood one of, I've got your back. And I just think it's a very, very fast way of conveying without big drama or ordeal that we are kind of emotionally connecting in a very, very positive way. So emotional fitness, do a little set of checks on yours. I'll be sending you the resources and the posts, um, uh, which leads of course to our own sense of resilience. I think our personal resilience to be able to, you know, survive stress and change is hugely important. During the space of the last six months, I've been doing two or three things a little differently, which I'd share with you as they may be helpful. Uh, the first is cultivating even more compassion um, for myself and for others. Uh, and I think we all know the research is quite overwhelming that expressed and demonstrated compassion really increases positive emotions. It creates positive working relationships and really helps to, to um, enhance cooperation and collaboration. So a bit more overt, conscious compassion. Secondly, I think many of us struggle with cognitive uh, overload. You know, we, we roughly, each of us receive about 11 million bits of uh, information every single second. And our brain, all of our brains, I'm sure some are uh, more powerful than others, but our brain effectively processes only about 40 
uh, uh, bits a second. So if we can't reduce the amount of information we receive, um, we need, I think, to compartmentalize, do certain tasks at certain times like we like we might exercise. Uh, so a sort of monotasking to help the cognitive overload, which certainly stresses me out and really weakens my both physical and emotional uh, uh, resilience. And then, as I've already mentioned, there are some very simple, powerful little courses online that can, um, you know, help us exercise more mindfulness. Um, social uh, social um, uh, uh, psychologists are finding that mindfulness predicts judgment accuracy, um, insight related problem solving, and the online training doesn't require you to be the two in three of us in the UK who don't know what mindfulness is. It doesn't remind, require you to be like some great expert and a devotee of woke. It just really helps you, I think, helps one exercise a little more mindfulness, which helps our sense of well-being. I, I also believe there's an amazing uh, uh, opportunity for us to, for us. to shape our personal uh, brand. And our brand, I think, is our own commitment and our own promise. Uh, how we think about and write about those things that are of interest to us uh, and to others. And having your personal brand, I think, encourages and enables you to, when you are leading others, to really have a depth uh, and a multifaceted approach uh, that can be, I think, most um, most helpful to all involved. And then I, I really do feel that this is a time as we as we sort of come through this vortex of change. It's not just a health pandemic. We also have a climate crisis. We have deep change within inclusion and diversity or we should be having deep change within inclusion and diversity. Uh, and of course, massive technology change. And I think that it requires us to, of course, use our head as leaders, but that the heart centered leadership qualities I am finding through my business coaching, through my mentorship, through the work that I'm doing as the executive chair of Mission Beyond, are very important. You know, much greater emphasis on real uh, truthfulness, uh, um, that we are demonstrating our trustworthiness uh, as, as leaders, that we model, you know, self-care, that we're open-minded, we own our own character flaws, we demonstrate, particularly with your extraordinary agenda, uh, a lifetime of learning uh, and open-mindedness as we build strategies that help us cope uh, with the displacement of 180 uh, million people and the sort of agenda that you are working through. So these heart-centered leadership qualities that I will include uh, in my uh, uh, resources update after this talk, I would really encourage you to look at because pretty much everyone from my own millennial children in the workplace to the people that I interact with are needing something extra from us as leaders uh, as they deal with the anxieties of return, new teams, or just phenomenal work schedule laid out in front of them. So I think the summary of that little section is, you know, if you are feeling good, if you are strong, uh, if you are kind and compassionate, I think your leadership in building back a better normal can start to project outwards. If you're anxious, stressed, unhappy, uh, it's very difficult uh, to really act as an emollient or a driver or a colleague uh, in this uh, new normal which we need to build. I also feel the second portion is about boosting morale. 
I think it's hugely important at this time for all of us uh, that we are boosting the morale of ourselves. And I've just described a whole host of ways that one can do that and boosting the morale uh, 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 of others. And there are three gems that I have used throughout uh, my career across four continents uh, in managing the very first SARS outbreak as I was based in Hong Kong and then Shanghai. Um, I used them extensively as I was running American teams um, 20 years ago during 9-11 and all that happened after that. And I think it is absolutely key, uh, tip number one, is to develop, intensify, really work at psychological safety for your teams. Um, in all teams that I have worked in, people are no different on this around the globe, creating an environment of, of fairness, either there are no favorites or everyone's a favorite, depending on your approach to leadership, encouraging outspoken views whilst deeply embracing inclusion and diversity builds great trust. If the articles that I read this morning about the abject lack of diversity and inclusion and social mobility in the civil service as a whole are accurate, then you've got amazing opportunity here uh, to be creating teams that in my experience, uh, the more uh, that individuals are chosen because of their age, their sex, their color, their creed, their sexuality, or their physical and cognitive abilities, then these are teams that form solutions uh, uh, um, very quickly and sustainably. So I think that individual and collective trust in your teams enables a sort of fabric of safety. Uh, and as this becomes stitched together, it will become woven in to your mission, a mission which I think is an extremely important one. The second one is huge for me. In fact, I talked to a group of people about this yesterday, just this subject. And that is at these times, as humans, it seems, emphasizing learning over winning um, I think teams of all ages need to feel that they're learning in a sort of unstructured and structured way, whether that's skill-based, shadowing days, internships, assignments, sabbaticals, more exposure to the reality of the problem that you policy professionals are, are looking to solve. And then a simple one, uh, but boy, is it uh, easy to do and immensely, if done authentically, effective, is to identify and celebrate little victories. Um, stop often to, to shout about the success, calling out little rock stars, heralding the teamship, the wins and the delights. Everyone is full of what's not right right now. We haven't had a great time as a species on this planet, and it's not necessarily going to get that much easier. So I would say those elements of, of boosting, you know, morale are, are is so, so important for ourselves. You feel better doing it and for our colleagues. And, and then I, I also think, you know, the real success of the mission. When I look at, you know, your work around electric vehicles, offshore wind, you know, flexible energy systems, phasing out of coal. I mean, these, this vortex of change in very large part uh, um, uh, affects, you know, all, all of you. But I think success is an absolute science. It was, of all people, Oscar Wilde who wrote a quote that I love around success. And he said very uncharacteristically, success, success is science. If you have the conditions, you will get the result. And I think the way I think about this is 
our job as leaders is to be the change that we want to see in our work, which in your case is pretty humongous and important, and uh, in our, 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 our teams. And so, you know, I think this these these elements of boosting ourselves, boosting others, creating an environment for success with true diversity and inclusion, I think that the mission will be more uh, appealing for all involved. I do think in this next little section, however, that you have an amazing opportunity as we come through this vortex of change. Every other major sort of set of crises we've had in the last sort of 50 or 75 years after the Spanish flu pandemic in the mid 50s, Sony brought out its transistor radio. They came out of doldrums, financial doldrums through innovation led growth. The transistor radio opened up markets, countries, environments. It was some of the best news as everyone bought a little tranny. Exactly the same in the pits of uh, economic downturn in the 70s, uh, Microsoft was born. I picked Microsoft as one of the top three companies by uh, uh, value uh, uh, today. And even the mighty Apple, after the dot-com bubble burst in 2000, uh, when everyone was very gloomy about any innovation-led tech, came out with their very first iPod. So we can, you know, growth is, is, is huge for all of us now. Uh, a new set of uh, uh, missions and narratives around the climate change work that you're uh, uh, committed to. But I think that the post COVID or this emergence through the vortex of change allows you all to experiment, uh, uh, particularly with your agenda, um, in, in ways that if they don't work or they don't land well, well, that was kind of COVID, you know, it was post COVID. It was the vortex of change. So I think it is an amazing time to be really uh, uh, innovative and to be galvanizing your teams in the way that I described around this innovation uh, uh, led growth. I think it is important uh, more so than perhaps ever before uh, as part of our vortex of change is indeed the technology changes, whether that's AI, cloud, blockchain, cybersecurity. We also have a major technology uh, change, which is, you know, embracing us all. And I think we have a responsibility as employers, as employees, as professional policymakers, that you have the skills that the world needs. There's a wonderful article I will include in my top resources that's actually from the World Economic Forum about the top 10 skills that the world needs by 2025. Whether that's analytical thinking and the innovation I've just talked about, leadership and social influence as you build your own brands, resilience, stress, uh, stress tolerance and flexibility, as I talked about at the start, and then very, very important, these communication uh, um, skills, because with the march of AI and machine learning, which is huge, changing every single role, many of our human skills become more important. I choose to use a Watson AI engine to diagnose illness because it is extremely suited to that task. I do not choose to have a machine tell me that the person I love most in the world has 12 weeks to live and how we're going to manage their treatment and their time on the planet. So look at those uh, top 10 skills. Many of them are life skills. Uh, some people call those soft skills. I suspect that isn't women, but um, uh, life skills that really enable us 
uh, to have the communication, build the narrative uh, uh, that is so essential, I think, at this time. Because this isn't a particularly lovely quote, but it is, I think, brutally true. It is by the thinker and writer Alvin Toffler, who wrote this time last year, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but they are those who can't learn, unlearn and relearn. And I think that is essential for all of us. You know, we may think we know it all. I thought I was the most advanced practicing ally and advocate uh, in the uh, world of unconscious bias. But Pamela Fuller's new book, you know, there are new things and uh, words matter. And I have to learn uh, uh, as we all do. So I think skills the world needs is a very, very important point for you to think about in your learning, your development and uh, your role inside of the department. I think your mission is an extraordinary uh, 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 mission. And my advice, I'm not in government, I'm not a policy professional, but I think for the planet, it is really about speed over elegance as we build back better in this area. Um, you know, if it is true that 180 million people will be displaced by climate change by 2100, then, you know, this, this need to, to get out there without a completely polished and perfect and elegant set of positioning, but with speed, I think is very, very important. As is the war for talent, it is staggering with many retiring, many baby boomers retiring, uh, many people not going to college, the skills that I've just described that the world needs, and the, the, the great and significant core of ethics in leadership and the combination of ethics, competency, and trust really uh, 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 means that, that the war for talent is something that you need to win. Now you have a mission that means that extraordinary people wanna come work with you and do these things. Uh, but I, I feel that we shouldn't take that for granted, that every organization at this time needs to relook at the wonderful work. It's, you know, a, a couple of decades old now, but it applies in every country I've worked in, in every industry I've worked in, in every single situation from transformation to crisis, uh, from crisis to reboot uh, uh, to innovation-led growth. And that is David Rocks's SCARF model. That at times of great change, all of us, need to feel as much personal safety. I talked about that uh, uh, earlier in creating, you know, psychological uh, 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 safety. Um, uh, and, and that within that safety, our status is, we all know our roles, our positions, our state of being. This is not the time for sort of fuzzy ambiguity. The C of SCARF, certainty, that's a hard one. None of us have much certainty at the moment. Let's focus on the things we can be clear about. For example, I've been reviewing a number of companies' amazing um, return to work and hybrid space models. And you can, you know, craft some certainty within that, that, you know, maybe coming to the office for three things is what we will do. Those three things will be for coaching and career-based work, for um, collaboration, and for a sense of community. So we can't give full certainty to everyone. No one has that. Uh, but helping to provide it, I think, is important. Uh, a sense of autonomy. This is a time for people to breathe life 
into their parts of the agenda, a sense of deep relatedness to each the other with the empathy that I've described and a feeling that people have that they are being treated uh, uh, fairly. So I, I, I really um, feel that if you pull all of these together, leadership is really about creating greatness in others. Whether it was the mighty Gaius Julius, not my favorite of leaders on every single dimension, but you know, some of his victories uh, because he made everyone that marched for him feel like a little emperor themselves. As I say, I wouldn't take that analogy too far, but you know, it, it, it worked for what he was trying to do. My amazing life coach I had for a year before I became a public company CEO at Premier Funnel, Dr. Paul Hoffman, uh, really helping me to create followership uh, as well as uh, uh, leadership. And then asking yourself each day, you know, why do others really work for me or with me? Um, you know, how do I make others feel? What is my personal philosophy? I'll never forget the mighty Mitt Romney when he was running for president. He said his personal philosophy was every day winning market share. I couldn't help thinking that was ever so American, but it worked. Well, he actually didn't because he didn't get his goal. But, uh, but what is your personal philosophy that people say every day I see that in Emma Smith? That's what she does and that's what it makes me feel. So in summary, you know, have your own leadership brand, own your narrative, either your personal narrative, the leadership's narrative or the department's narrative. At this time, I think it is equally important to use your head and your heart. Do not rest on your laurels that you have one of the most exciting and important agendas in the world because there is a war for talent. And if you don't make people feel good, as well as having great work with really diverse, please civil service, come more diverse, um, with high performing teams, I think you will have amazing success.